Good afternoon. It's uh, Friday the 29th of May 2020, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Mike Robinson. Joining me in the studio today, Patrick Henningsen from 21st Century Wire. Welcome to the program, Patrick. Great to be with you, Mike. I haven't had a haircut in eight weeks. Uh, good stuff. Uh, well, lots of people complaining about Brian uh, not having had a haircut in eight weeks either. So so we'll, uh, we'll see what happens uh, in the near future because, of course, but we will all be able to get haircuts. Uh, and I don't have this problem, uh, but we'll all be able to get haircuts in the not too distant future because we're still we're still on level four of the lockdown diagram here. How Patrick, that, how is that possible? How Mark? is that possible? Well, uh, Boris Johnson unveiled what many described as significant loosening of the rules. And yet we're still on level four. So nobody's quite sure what is going on. Um, well, this is how uh, this is how Boris explained it. I understand that people will have questions as, how to do, uh, as to how to do all of this safely. And we will publish guidance on these changes to help people, to help you make the most of them. Now, I know inevitably that there may be some anomalies or apparent inconsistencies in these rules. And uh, clearly, what we're proposing is still just a fraction of the social interaction each of us would normally enjoy. I know many of you will find this frustrating, and I'm sorry about that, uh, but I'm afraid that is unavoidable, given the, given the nature of the invisible enemy that we are fighting. So it's unavoidable that they can't come up with a consistent message, uh, Patrick, because of the nature of the invisible enemy that we're all fighting. Uh, it's so invisible, it's probably not even there. But anyway, that's another issue. The question is, Pat, what, what is the new lockdown? Where are we at? Well, this is an incredible uh, uh, list of diktats that have been issued by the government. This is from uh, the source here, the Daily Mail. But uh, there are basically all sorts of restrictions, Mike, like you can meet people from other households, but absolutely no hugging. Hugging is forbidden with people from other households. So if you do come across people that you feel inclined to embrace, do hold back and do the right thing. Stay alert and control the virus. But there's all sorts of little, like you can go visit at another house, Mike, but you can't sleep over and uh, you know go for dinner, but you mustn't stay after dinner for aperitifs or port and brandy or a game of, of Scrabble or bridge. That's absolutely verboten under the new directives. Uh, so we are, we're just sitting and waiting to see what the government is telling us what we can and can't do, Mike. There's a very long list and it's a very detailed, uh, very um, intricate list of well, do's and don'ts. Well, indeed. And we'll be coming on to a little bit more of that uh, shortly. But in the meantime, uh, Rishi Sunak, uh, not happy that uh, enough businesses are being put out of business fast enough, has decided that uh, really... Uh, businesses are going to have to start contributing to the cost of the furlough scheme. Uh, so he said this, employers will have to start paying 20% of furloughed staff salaries. Uh, and, well, this has not uh, gone down very well with the Institute of Directors. Uh, and they uh, warned yesterday that probably 25% of companies using the furlough scheme will con have difficulties contributing to it. Uh, and uh, much many, you know, many, many more workers likely to be made redundant as a result if the companies can even survive uh, that kind of thing. Isn't that what you've been saying for, for really weeks on this show, Mike, is that the furlough scheme was really just delaying the inevitable, which is going to be uh, redundancies and companies just letting go of, of workers. It's only delayed that process. It has only delayed that process, but as well as that, of course, uh, companies that have uh, taken advantage of the furlough st scheme in, in an attempt to keep afloat um, actually, lots of them finding that they have not even been able to, to stay afloat because, of course, that's only one of the fixed costs that they have to deal with. Uh, and rent is a fairly large uh, fixed cost as well. Other fixed costs haven't been forgiven, so they've got to be they've got to be paid for with no income. So how companies are expected to to survive, I'm not entirely clear. Uh, I would suggest that they were never expected to survive. Uh, this is all about the restructuring of economy. Uh, not just economy, government as well, but we've been discussing that for the last couple of weeks too. Uh, well, one of the other things that uh, has been allegedly there to help people, of course, uh, was the mortgage holiday. Um, well, this is UK Finance, who've pretty much decided that it's time to 
give up on the mortgage holiday now. So, so the government's suggesting that uh, banks should be uh, encouraged to extend the mortgage holiday for a further three months. Uh, the bank's not so happy about that. Uh, they're saying we do not believe that such an approach is the be in the best interest of customers and that a more tailored approach would be more appropriate at this time. So what they're talking about is saying no blanket uh, forgiveness of or, or delay on mortgage repayments for another three months, they would have to means test every individual mortgage holder uh, and decide whether they uh, were were capable of, uh, of paying or not. And if they're capable of paying, then they've got to pay, no matter what other pressures they might be under. So, uh, you know, uh, individuals, all the pressure being removed as much as possible. I'm being slightly sarcastic there, of course. Uh, but look, we don't have to worry because the Premier League is going to be back uh, behind closed doors and to make sure that uh, the atmosphere comes across uh, on television. They are going to uh, fake the, uh, the the sounds of the, the chanting and the, uh, and the crowd. You're kidding me. No, I'm So not. like a video game. It's going to be like a video game. Well, they're only already doing this with other uh, sporting events, particularly motorsport. They're, they're playing video games uh, and, and making it seem, you know, trying to keep it, people engaged uh, on that basis. But Actually, Boris wanted us to uh, pass a message on to everybody. When you are watching the Premier League on your television set, if you're in a room full of people, try to keep your voice down and not expend a lot of energy because you might project water vapor, which could, in theory, carry COVID. So very calm. And also turn the volume of the television down so that people don't shout in the room. That's from that's from the COVID uh, action team I see. Di directly. So we're just passing that on to you as a helpful suggestion. Hint, keep, yes. keep safe, stay keep, alert. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, look, the question is, what was in Boris's briefing? Let's uh, let's briefly have a look at some of the graphics that they produced as these are being produced by Cobra. Fantastic stuff. So uh, of course, the five tests, uh, all about how we uh, ever get out of uh, lockdown, if we ever do. I'm going to suggest that we're not ever going to get out of lockdown, but we'll come on to that in a second. Test one, of course, we've got to continue to protect the NHS's ability to cope uh, because it's so inundated uh, with people at the moment uh, that it's it's you know right on a knife edge but we've got to keep it uh, keep it below that knife edge and uh, so that's why we're continuing to be locked down uh, as you can see the trend in that graph uh, absolutely demonstrates justifies the lockdown there patrick doesn't it yeah with everything flattening out to zero yes. i can't imagine why uh we wouldn't be on lockdown, Mike. Well, Silly uh, idea, isn't uh, it? Uh, absolutely. Uh, but, and of course, uh, deaths, uh, the numbers of deaths. Now, that, again, we'll say it again. This is not to underestimate people's loss in any way, shape or form. But this is about the, the point that we've been trying to make from the beginning here is whether or not the lockdown is uh, justifiable, if it's appropriate. Uh, and uh, of course, we're, what we're seeing here is uh, the number of deaths continuing to drop as well. So why are we uh, still uh, in lockdown and why social distancing still a thing? Now, look, uh, one of the things that I just wanted to highlight on this graph that is pretty stark, I think, is this. If we look there uh, and uh, in fact there and there and there and there and indeed there, what do we see? We see uh, half the number of deaths uh, at each of those points on the graph. Uh, and uh, I'm very interested to, to find out if anybody has any idea or any explanation for this, because it's clear that on weekends and on bank holidays, only about half the number of people die as uh, during on a weekday. Now, this must be related in some way to the number of staff that are um, on uh, call or on duty in hospitals. Uh, but uh, I'd like to understand that a little bit more. I don't have an answer for it at the moment. So if anybody can help with that, that would be much appreciated. But look, the test two, see a sustained and consistent fall in the daily death rates. Of course, they're putting up uh, death rates which are here, which are attributed to COVID-19. Um, and uh, I'm just going to make the point once again, they're ignoring the deaths as a result, a direct result of the lockdown. Now, what we've put on here, of course, are the uh, their numbers sorry i do apologize for that that, that was their numbers uh, on there uh, and uh, uh, so even if you accept that their numbers are correct 30 to 50 percent of the people that have died in the last six weeks uh, have been as a result of lockdown not as a result of covid 19 that's even if you accept the government's attribution um, so uh, 
uh, which we don't, because some of the, because we know that lots of people are being having uh, their deaths attributed to COVID nineteen that weren't COVID nineteen related. So uh, again, they are using test two as a justification for the lockdown, but test two isn't borne out by the numbers. Uh, reliable data from SAID showing the rate of infection. We're going to come on to the rate of infection later on. Again, that's falling away. Uh, and uh, well, we'll show that later. Uh, test uh, four, be confident that the range of operational challenges, including testing and PPP, PPE are in hand. Well, you know, this is a matter of logistics. Uh, how many weeks are we into this now? Even if, if PPE is still required? 10, 10, 10 plus weeks now. Somehow we still we seem to be requiring more and more PPE, despite the fact that the virus is reducing to levels, you know, very very low levels. So I'm yeah. not quite sure how that works. And it's a logistical issue, so it doesn't. It's not a. It's not really a primary uh, issue. There's something that can be sorted out really by you know taking deliveries, Mike. So uh, uh, absolutely. And then finally, test five, of course, uh, adjustments to the current measures will not risk second peak of infections. What second peak? There is no second peak. There's been no second peak in any other country in the world. Where is the justification for a, any kind of fear of a second peak? Second wave theory, Mike, is, is what we called it last week. Second wave theory, because it is in fact a theory. Uh, we're still waiting for the second wave. They've been waiting for it in Denmark, Mike. They've been waiting for the second wave now for, for over a month and the second wave hasn't arrived. Of course, Sweden's not having a second wave because they didn't go into lockdown to begin with. So they don't have that that problem or they don't have that specter of a theory that may or may not happen, as is Belarus, as is Japan, South Korea. They don't have second waves. Neither do the non-lockdown states in America, Mike. So where is the second wave coming from? Um, I don't think it doesn't look like it's coming. It's it's not coming. I yeah. think we can be pretty sure of that now. But there was one thing Boris said yesterday, which really took the biscuit as far as I was concerned. Remember, we've been locked in our homes uh, for the last uh, lot of weeks. So let's have a listen to this. And crucially, we know that transmission of the virus is far lower outdoors, so we can confidently allow more interaction outside. So when did that happen? Is that new? Uh, did the coronavirus change its behavior in the last week? Well, or? apparently it doesn't operate on weekends and, it, and now it seems to uh, only operate or it doesn't operate outside. So now we're allowed to go outside because it's, it's, you're much, more, much less likely to get it outside. But we've been inside because it's been dangerous to go outside. So I'm not clear. Is, is this an epiphany that Sage had uh, this week, Mike? Or have they known this since the beginning? Well, I think is, they should have known it since the beginning, Patrick. Is, is that part of the science? Uh, well, is it part of the science? Well, I think we, we, we had this first on the program, Mike, here on April 9th, I think. Uh, it was the beginning of April, and this is what we said. We'll just repeat it again. Uh, for, this is Dr. Newt Witkowski. He's a former head of biostatistics and epidemiology at Rockefeller University. And he says, for respiratory disease, the flu ends during springtime. People spend more time outdoors because outdoors, the virus cannot spread easily. That is a form of containment. Spend more time outdoors. This is what we told our, our listeners and uh, viewers back at the beginning of April, Mike. And so, and again, he just uh, says going outdoors is what stops every respiratory virus. And we did share that with everybody at the beginning of April, Mike. Uh, but it, it's, it seemed to take quite a while for that type of knowledge or that science to filter through to, Sage to the government level. Mm -hmm. So but we are happy that they finally got it. Um, so uh, finally, on this little segment, uh, Patrick, is, is lockdown justified? Well, this is the big question. And uh, we'll, we'll hear from Dr. Uh, Sunetra Gupta uh, in a little bit later. But she's the uh, professor for theoretical epidemiology at Oxford University. And uh, here's what she says. Uh, I think there's a chance that we might have done better by doing nothing at all, or at least by doing something different, which would have been to pay attention to protecting the vulnerable, she's talking about the elderly population clustered in care homes, uh, to have thought about protecting the vulnerable 30 or 40 years ago when we started cutting hospital beds. The roots of this go a long way back. Uh, very poignant quote there from uh, one of the top epidemiologists in the country, Mike. 
Um, so this is what happened yesterday. That on Wednesday, of course, uh, they or yesterday morning, perhaps it was that they they released uh, uh, track and trace, uh, or at least the test and trace, as they're calling it. This is what the government's doing. They say they're doing all that they can to develop a vaccine or a treatment for coronavirus. But in the meantime, we've got to uh, make sure that we uh, have to test and trace because that's going to allow us to get back to normal life. Not clear whether that's the new normal or the old normal. I think I have my suspicions. Um, so they're saying uh, uh, an army of 25,000 tracers contacting people who have tested positive for COVID-19, track down their close contacts. Uh, Matt Hancock uh, uh, said this. Uh, he said, uh, it's your civic duty. This will be voluntary at first because we trust everyone to do the right thing, but we can quickly make it mandatory if that's what it takes. Now, I suspect that this is going to be the same narrative that we hear with respect to va vaccines as well. Yeah. Uh, but for test and trace, that's his position. But that's what it takes to do what? Uh, that's the question. That, that is a very good question. Uh, now, of course, uh, people who have been identified as having had close contact with someone who's tested positive for coronavirus, uh, they're not going to be told who it was that dubbed them in uh, because uh, that might cause reprisals. Um, so, uh, so therefore, you're never going to know. A name's going to be picked out of the air. You're going to get a phone call from uh, one of their contact tracers uh, to say that you've been in contact with an unnamed person uh, and that therefore you've got to go through the mandatory uh, self-isolation procedure and your family, of course, would be affected by that as well. Um, so uh, we warned about this a uh, long time ago. I also spoke about this at AV11, Mike. This is the exact Chinese system. Uh, in, in China, you're assigned a color uh, on one of their main systems. Uh, you're assigned a color whether you've been in contact with somebody. And if it pops up on your cell phone, you have to go into isolation immediately, and then you'll be contacted by a, a health official or someone from the government. And that goes for anybody that was in within using cell phone data. Uh, using apps and cell phone data to track how close you were to anybody. This is a recipe for absolute chaos, Mike, and this can absolutely ruin some people's lives. Uh, this means that whatever you're doing, whether you're working, traveling, you're on your way to get married, whatever, uh, you have to follow this new technocratic system, even though, and here's the important point, Mike, even though the majority of the population, based on the data, overwhelmingly, the majority of the population is not at any serious risk. The majority of the population is asymptomatic. And the majority of fatalities and people at risk are in a very narrow, specific uh, age profile and health profile mm -hmm. and demographic. So the general public has never been at serious risk to COVID-19 based on the statistics, not just in this country, Mike, but in all countries across the world. We knew this, in fact, after the outbreak in Hubei province, if you went and looked at the data and you drill down and look at the demographics affected. Um, so the question is, what kind of test are you going to? Well, initially, it's going to be the test to find out whether you've got the, uh, the virus itself, even if that test were reliable. That's the test they're going to use. Uh, but of course, they have been pushing the idea for quite a number of weeks now that it's antibody tests that are going to be the future. Uh, we're 90, uh, NHS antibody tests from next week. This is for NHS staff uh, uh, alone, but then they're going to roll this out to, uh, much broader. Um, so that's Sky News reporting that. And in fact, the Nursing Times here, their headline even stronger. It becomes a game changer. Uh, antibody tests become a game changer. Well, are they a game changer? This is the question. Let's have a look at some of the science. Um, so here is a scientific paper, anti-spike, anti-nucleocapsid, uh, 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 nu uh, neutralizing antibodies in SARS-CoV-2 hospitalized patients and asymptomatic carriers. Um, and the point that they're making here, they say using longitudinal plasma samples for, from 30 COVID-19 patients, we observed that virus-specific antibodies are detectable in 100% of patients two weeks after symptom, symptom onset. We also show that these patients produced variable levels of neutralizing antibodies, which reached a plateau two weeks after symptom onset and then declined in the majority of patients. Furthermore, we report that neutralizing antibodies were undetectable in 56% of asymptomatic carriers. Okay, so they produced a nice little graph. Let's have a look at it. Here we go. Uh, and it's very, very clear that as time goes on very quickly, uh, people, it becomes undetectable whether they've, got, whether they've ever had antibodies 
for COVID-19. Um, and uh, so in fact, after 59 days, 54.5% are undetectable for antibodies. Uh, and 70, after 74 days, 63.6% .6 are undetectable for antibodies. So if the future uh, immunity passports are going to be based on the idea of antibodies, uh, then very quickly we're going to find ourselves in the position of perhaps, uh, if you remember that we, if, if we look at the Chinese model, Patrick, and, and this was uh, sort of expressed uh, by some of the, the UK based uh, immunity passport companies, the companies are bidding for this kind of business. Uh, it looks like you might get a red, an amber and a green but also a blue if, if it's undetermined what you are. Now, what are the rules going to be uh, for people that uh, their status is undetermined, right? Antibody tests are not the way forward. They're certainly not going to be a game changer. This uh, and other scientific uh, studies show that. They don't work for a one-size-fits-all Chinese-style government-centric approach, Mike, uh, because there are problems with false positives on antibody tests as well as false negatives as well. But the accuracy on the whole with antibody tests is with the test itself, Mike, is problematic. Then you get to the other problems, which are what you said before about the length of time and antibodies will be present uh, in one system. But there's other ways that you can be immune from something like SARS-2, COVID-19, uh, but without showing antibodies. And well, I think you, we're, we're going to come on yeah. to that in a second. The, the key point here is we've been constantly hearing this narrative over the last lot of weeks uh, that we don't know whether immunity is long term. It might only be a short term immunity. And of course, if you're basing your statement on whether there are antibodies present in your body, then of course you can make that claim. You might be able to make that claim that, that you that no longer have antibodies are no longer immune to the second wave, which is going to come along, right? But here's the key point, Patrick. But we don't even know, before we go, Mike, we don't even know if SARS COVID-19 is going to be around for a long time either because the original SARS was crushed and extinguished and pretty much disappeared out of the general population in season, Mike, or in a year. Uh, absolutely. So they're basing, they're reconstructing this new normal based on the unknown or this prediction that somehow COVID-19, the rock star of respiratory viruses, is going to have a long career like Mick Jagger and be touring the world for years and years. And we don't know that. In fact, uh, you look at other respiratory diseases, Mike, other coronaviruses, it might not be that, in fact. So, but yet they're rolling out all these programs. The gravy train is endless. Yep. Okay. So here's the, the next key point. Uh, immunity comes from T cells, not antibodies on a long-term basis. Here's Science uh, Magazine. Uh, T cells found in COVID-19 patients bode well for long-term immunity. Uh, and uh, they're saying that uh, the T cells help us fight some viruses. Uh, their importance for battling SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, has been unclear. Now, two studies reveal infected people harbor T cells that target the virus uh, and may help them recover and so on. So let's look at, uh, at one of the uh, scientific papers. Targets of T cell responses to SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus in humans with COVID-19 disease and unexposed individuals. This is really important, unexposed individuals. Let's have a look and see what they're uh, saying here. Uh, importantly, we detected SARS-CoV-2 reactive CD4 T cells in 40 to 60% of unexposed individuals, suggesting cross-reactive T cell recognition between circulating common cold coronaviruses and SARS-CoV-2. Right. So obviously there's more work needs to be done here, Patrick, but, 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 but this is this is absolutely indicating that there are some people that have never been a significant number of people that have never been in, uh, uh, infected with uh, COVID-19 with SARS-CoV-2 have immunity built in based on immunity they developed through exposure to other coronaviruses, including the common cold. That's so important. That's what's called the adaptive immune system, Mike. And by the way, for a respiratory disease that would first uh, get into your system through the nose and the throat, you also have a, a top layer immune functions in the tissue, in the mucous membranes of the sort of resp uh, beginning of your respiratory tract. And again, that's another part of the adaptive immune system. So between this and T cells, you can, in theory and in practice, according to this study, Mike, have some level of immunity to COVID-19 without ever being infected by it. That's an incredible 
uh, point, Mike, to make. It absolutely is. So when we've got uh, headlines like this from the BBC uh, from a day or two ago, uh, NHS app paves the way for immunity passports. And as we've already uh, indicated here, the immunity passports look might look like the Chinese model. And certainly this is how uh, some people in the UK envisage it happening, uh, where you're given a green and amber or a red status, uh, but also a blue status based on whether they can actually identify what your status actually is. Um, then uh, on the basis that, that antibody testing seems to be the way that they're going, and we've just shown uh, evidence that antibody testing is not reliable, uh, the fact that they're ignoring, uh, it seems, T-cell status uh, in this. What this begins to look like is uh, the new normal involves immunity passports uh, and a, a moving status. So if Boris is talking about having a moving scale of one to five for what the whole country is doing, uh, immunity passports seem to be heading in the direction of a moving status for us as individuals. So the country may be relatively open, but we as individuals end up completely locked down, or the country ends up locked down and some lucky individuals end up less locked down. Um, this becomes a very, as you say, chaotic and complicated situation. And uh, it can only be utterly divisive uh, amongst friends, families, communities. And that, that status that you're talking about that the government is supposedly monitoring and communicating to the public, Mike, that's a completely arbitrary status. That's, that, that's something that's uh, based on computer models that's coming from the science advisor. It doesn't necessarily reflect the reality out in the world. And in fact, it's not scientific. There's a debate that you can have about the wizardry of computer models. Isn't that how we got into this lockdown mess to begin with is an over-reliance on computer models, and that's exactly how the R number is determined. It's through a complicated set of assumptions that are programmed into computer models. It ignores the dynamics of any particular outbreak or any particular epidemic. It's purely uh, an exercise of mathematics and computers. Doesn't always reflect reality, and that's the problem. Uh, absolutely, we'll come on to R in a second, just before we get there. If you like what the UK Column is doing and if you'd like to support us, then please head over to ukcolumn.org forward slash community where there are options to help us out there. And uh, another reminder that if you would like to uh, send a, a letter to David Noakes uh, and offer support, then uh, his prison number A7081DY. He is at HMP Exeter uh, 30 New North Road, Exeter EX 44EX. Uh, now, one of the other uh, amazing slides that uh, Boris likes to present is the R number slide. Uh, here it is from COBRA, um, showing what happens if R is three, for example, that shows uh, how many people end up being infected by that. Uh, if R is one, how many people end up being infected by that. Uh, well, I just wanted to highlight uh, this website, Patrick, uh, the COVID-19 acceler <coughs> accelerometer dashboard. Now, it's quite hard to find this because if you type in COVID-19 accelerometer dashboard into Google, uh, you won't find it. Uh, it's quite interesting that they don't seem to want to list it, but uh, it's quite a good website because they attempt to calculate uh, R for a, a, quite a number of countries around the world, as you can see. Um, and uh, well, who's behind this? Uh, it is uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Garegan Papoan, uh, who is uh, from um, Maryland University in the United States. He's Armenian uh, and he and his team have been uh, working on building a model for this. The model uh, has several caveats um, and, and they, they do explain the caveats on their website very well. Uh, they're not claiming that it's 100% accurate because of course it can't be 100% accurate. Uh, but one of, the, one of the key points that they make, Patrick, is uh, that um, it, the model really only works um, if uh, you, they may not have access to the total number of infections in any particular country, but they say that so long as the, the, the way that the infections are counted remains the same, uh, is consistent across a period of time, then they can be relatively accurate uh, with, with the R number. But what they, the point that they make is that if, if uh, countries and governments start uh, changing the situation, for example, by doing much more testing over time. So this week they're only testing at this level. Next week they're testing at a higher level. The following week they're testing at a higher level again. Then it becomes much harder to accurately model the thing. And so when we look at these graphs in a second, their point is that as time has gone on uh, and more tests have been done, 
that actually their model will probably over uh, estimate the R number. So where they're showing, for example, uh, that uh, the UK is uh, currently at 1.2, that's probably an overestimate, an overestimate because of the extra testing that's going on at the moment. But there's, there's their graph, which very closely reflects, as we'll see in a second, uh, the official uh, narrative for R. Um, although the, the British government doesn't want to put any numbers on the graph that they have produced, they've just sort of produced a nice little picture. Um, but uh, this is the key point, Patrick. Uh, this was locked down here. Uh -huh, yes. Right. So uh, R was already uh, rapidly on its way to one whenever they decided to move to lockdown. So this is just another piece of evidence we've shown you over the last uh, couple of weeks, a few weeks, um, how that for other ways of counting, uh, that it looks pretty much the same, that lockdown was inappropriate, it came too late, um, even, you know, even if it was gonna work at all, and therefore it wasn't the right response. Uh, that's for the UK. Let's have a look at the United States, pretty much the same situation. I appreciate that not every, that, that date for, for lockdown in the US is a bit of a guesstimate because different states lock down at different times. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, I think that that date that I've put on that graph was for when New York uh, locked down, who were one of the first. Um, but it's the same picture, Patrick. Sure. It's the same picture. Even so with a margin of error, it's, it still tells a very clear story, which is that the R number, even with a margin of error, even if you take their data at face value, it, it has already peaked before lockdown. Uh, miles before lockdown. Uh, and so this is the government's uh, effort at the same kind of graph, and it looks very similar. So, so these guys have got it largely correct. And that's why we're focusing on this, right? Because the whole policy of uh, lockdown uh, part two, uh, here's uh, Al Johnson there. Uh, the whole policy here is based really on the R number. So let's, let's try to extrapolate what exactly is the R number? Can you actually use the R number? That's the big question. Everything is hinging on the R number. So let's take a closer look at what the experts say. Let's look, talk to the top pathologists and epidemiologists in the country. I know they're probably not sitting on the SAGE team, but they do exist and they are working in institutions uh, around the country. Here is Dr. John Leemike, leading pathologist in the UK. This is what he had to say about the use of the R number by the government. He says, as a former professor of pathology, and someone who has had a long research career, I'm very familiar with critical assessment of data. And in the case of R, I can tell you that this is not a strong enough number to bear the burden of any government policy, let alone a policy with the magnitude of lockdown. That's Dr. John Lee, but he goes on, and I think this is quite poignant. In fact, the epidemiological models that generate R are probably less reliable than long range weather forecasts. This is, again, Dr. John Lee, top UK pathologist. That's what he has to say mm -hmm. about the, uh, the R number, Mike. So, I mean, there's plenty of these experts uh, that have weighed in on this, uh, and we'll show you another one as well. But uh, the, the point is, is, is it enough to, to weigh your whole policy? And think about the enormous costs of lockdown to the economy, to society, to the government itself in terms of uh, confidence and the public trust in government. These are all prices that the state might pay and the people might pay for a lockdown policy. And it's all hinging on, for at least the last few weeks, Mike, on the R number. Mm -hmm. First it was, we, the lockdown was to save the NHS. And then lockdown would be lifted once the NHS caught up and the capacity caught up to the surge in COVID cases, which never actually arrived. But the, the, there's been two months now to expand the capacity of the NHS. So most countries did it fine. Mm -hmm. In fact, the countries that didn't lock down, they didn't have uh, their healthcare system overrun. It didn't happen, basically. It's only really happened anecdotally in a couple of major cities around the world that it seemed to be overrun, but then on closer inspection, it really wasn't. We're talking mainly about Northern Italy, New York City, and you could say, put Spain in that category mm -hmm. as well. So, but let's, let's move on and see what some of the other experts had to say about the R number. This is uh, Dr. Sunetra Gupta. Apologies for the misspelling of her first name. That's uh, my fault. Theoretical epidemiology professor at Oxford University. This is what she has to say about the R number. In almost every context, we've seen the uh, epidemic grow 
turn around and die away, almost like clockwork. Mike here, she's talking about the behavior of the virus in every country, not just the UK. They follow a familiar pattern. Different countries have had different lockdown policies, and yet what we've observed is almost a uniform pattern of behavior, which is highly consistent with the SIR model. That's a standard epidemiological model to do with contagions and effect, infections. And she continues and says, to me, this, that suggests that much of the driving force was due to the buildup of immunity. This is a really important concept. Mike. And it's hinted by the fact that the French uh, and uh, others are now suggesting that this virus was at work November, December time, months before we, it was ever even a headline in the Daily Mail. Yeah, and she, she goes on to explain why that's significant. And here, the R number, the R rate, as she says, is principally dependent on how many people are immune. It's maximum transmission potential, and the maximum transmission potential can only uh, be realized in a population that is completely susceptible. Mm. Now, and just to move on, uh, once it, the virus, starts to spread through the population, its R number declines from its maximum potential of R0. Uh, and then the reason it does that is because it's using up its resources. It's using up the susceptible members of the population, mm -hmm. the people who are catching it. Those are susceptibles. And those susceptibles are becoming immune, at least temporarily, says Dr. Gupta. And then finally, to round this analysis off, so I don't think you can calculate R in the absence of knowledge of how many people are immune. So she's basically saying that the R number is really irrelevant uh, in terms of determining, uh, you know, what, what is the true case of the virus uh, path uh, and trajectory within a population. Mm -hmm. And she's, she's saying that very clearly. Other experts have said the same thing, Mike. So it's really doesn't, it doesn't really work. Why? Because it's a theoretical number. It's, it's modeled. If the modeling is wrong, the assumptions are wrong, then the results of the R number are going to be wrong that the government's presenting. This is why the top epidemiologists are shying away from relying on something as arbitrary and as uh, convoluted, in some cases, as the R number. Mm. Those are the experts saying this, not necessarily us. But then, so what does this mean in the, the big picture here? So here is the uh, famous uh, tripwire graph, uh, which was released by Al Johnson. There he is again. Uh, so this is the tighten restrictions if the R number goes above one. So again, the, uh, the disease R number should only apply to a population that is completely vulnerable uh, to, to the disease, i.e. where everyone is susceptible. That's the point. It only really works in a theoretical setting or some kind of a controlled environment, like the Diamond Princess Cruise Liner, for instance. Mm -hmm. In a real population, it's much more complicated than that. In fact, you might not want to be using a com computer model uh, unless you're absolutely certain that it's being programmed completely perfectly. And we know from past experience with computer models, that really doesn't happen very often. So there's only two possibilities here, is that if no one had the disease yet, so you could model the R number accurately at the beginning of an epidemic, Mike, if nobody had it and you could track it in real time. And the second option there is uh, there's no way to control the spread of disease. So both of those things don't apply to the UK. Uh, not only we were very late in the game in terms of infections, but uh, it, we, we absolutely have ways mm -hmm. to control disease. You have treatments, you have sanitation, you have uh, hospitalization, pharmaceutical interventions, lots of things, the trappings of the modern world, basically. And so they're trying to basically, the government's trying to say with its approach to the R number that no, we don't have any of those things, and this virus can just break out and run away at any time. And we know from respiratory diseases that are seasonal that that actually doesn't happen in reality. So again, what sort of science are they being guided by? But we'll go back to this graph, and here's the other point here. And this, the, the, the Bill Gates version, Mike, would be, we don't have any vaccines uh, left. I, it's covered up here, but I call that MS Gates speak, mm -hmm. basically. So he would say, yes, we could use the R number if nobody had been vaccinated yet. He's implying that everyone needs to get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. So that's how he would look at the R number there. So basically, the whole basis of this is completely um, it doesn't work. It's null and void, basically. And so let's go back here, and uh, the final conclusion, Mike, is that computer modeling is based on elaborate assumptions. And who do we have to thank for that? There's Neil Ferguson, 
uh, as well, the Imperial College modeler himself extraordinaire. And so again, Mike, it's just a total reliance on computer models. Here we are once again, mm -hmm. computer modeling part two. Uh, absolutely. So where does that take us? It takes us to infections, hospitalizations already peaked in March. So again, graph after graph after graph showing the same thing, peaks in March uh, and no need for lockdown now. Exactly. And take a closer look here and we'll just circle that section. That's March 18th. By the way, this is from the CDC's own data, Mike, uh, but also from uh, Newt Witkowski and his academic report that was released uh, last month. So that's COVID-19 hospitalizations peaked on March 18th. This was before lockdown in the United States. Mm -hmm. So again, all of this mask wearing now in the middle, middle of May, people are putting on masks and there's fights over PPE and masks. But we're showing you right there, the virus had already peaked, infections had peaked in the United States. Let's look at the UK because it's even more interesting, actually. Infections, hospitalizations already peaked in March. And this is data here. As you can see, let's look at that's around April 10th. Uh, so in, infections would have predated that by about 14 days. So that would have put you in March, late March. But that's uh, deaths per day. That's the highest number in April 10th. Mm. Okay, we're now at the end of May. So it's, it's clearly tailed off uh, by then. And there's, there's infections per day, Mike. That's also around April 10th, mm. April 12th. So again, we can see that uh, the, the virus had already done its thing. And just to give you a, a better look here, this is from the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine in, in Oxford, looking at uh, Professor Carl Hennigan's data. And what we can see here, it's very clear, there's the lockdown line right there. That's March 24th. But look at respiratory infections in the country, Mike. Mm -hmm. They peaked well before that. So again, uh, this is the real data, the real numbers here. And it's telling a very different story than what the government is trying to basically tell the public with the science. So they're being guided by the science, we're, we're told constantly. But yet, which science are they being guided by? Because surely the science they're being guided by isn't taking the real data into account. It's science fiction as far as I can see. So the other myth that we just want to uh, uh, blow out of the water is the COVID exponential myth. A lot of people saying it's exponential. The COVID growth has been exponential. At no time has it really been exponential. And who's telling us this? It's none other than Dr. Michael Levitt. He's a professor of structural biology at Stanford University who won the Nobel Peace Prize or the Nobel Prize for Science, sorry, in 2013. He says, from the very first confirmed case, the rate of growth of COVID-19 confirmed cases is not constant. Thus, growth was never exponential. Very important point. But he does go on and say, so the terrible thing that we're fearing is not true about a single outbreak. Instead, the constant exponential rate is decreasing rapidly. Although the initial growth rate is very fast, it's decreasing at an exponential rate. So the decrease is exponential, but the increase in growth of the virus was never exponential. That's from a Nobel laureate, Mike. So uh, maybe they have better people on the SAGE team that have different data and different analysis. Who knows? But we should give them a chance. Uh, they've got a couple weeks left, hopefully, of lockdown. And maybe there's some interesting science that's going to be brought forward. I, I wait with bated breath. Uh, what's Matt Hancock been up to then? Well, he's the uh, House Secretary, as everybody knows. And we're, we've been constantly, of course, again, guided by the science. And uh, there's Matt Hancock there. So the question is, Mike, which science are they being guided by? And, you know, we've had our crack team, uh, the UK column has a science advisory panel. It's, uh, it's a secret panel, but nonetheless, very highly qualified and skilled. And they've been working on this all week, Mike, to try to figure out how the government has got the science wrong. That's our UK column crack science team, okay, our advisory, our sage, as it were. And so this is what they had to share with us. And again, we'll, we'll look at this. They've come up with a what I think is a very plausible theory here. And so we're going to bring in our uh, top scientific advisor. Some of you might know him, see him as familiar. That's uh, Officer Chief Science Officer Rimmer. And he's been advising us on what is basically the Dunning-Kruger effect. And so his theory is that the government are suffering uh, from the Dunning-Kruger effect. And basically to explain that, that's the, it's a theory that you, if you're overconfident uh, and you, you basically lack 
the uh, cognitive, uh, you have cognitive bias, okay? So it's with people with low ability uh, at a task and they overestimate their ability. And it's related to the cognitive bias of illusory superiority and comes from an inability to recognize their lack of ability, Mike. So again, uh, this is where the government is according to Officer Rimmer. They're about right there. So that's just after the peak of I'm so great and really tailing down into I know nothing. But you know, there's another algorithm that they applied to this because we want to show a good variation and uh, dexterity of our science team. And so we're looking at the other algorithm, here's the other way of looking at it. And again, that's where the government is there. That's just coming down off the peak of Mount Stupid uh, of the Dunning-Kruger effect. So confidence was high, not so high right now, but we want to make sure we're hoping that the government can get up here into a, a plateau of sustainability, up the slope of enlightenment. And again, that's from our team. So the Dunning-Kruger effect seems to be afflicting the government right now and the science, because the science just doesn't add up. And of course, one of the reasons is it just becomes so complicated. All these R numbers, all of these sombreros to be flattened, curves to be crushed and, and things like that. So for the visual learners out there, we, we came up, our science team came up and found this, uh, thanks to a, a viewer of the UK column, sent this through to us. So for the visual learners out there, we, we thought this might be helpful. So as you can see, the black is the conga line of 100 people uh, during the COVID epidemic. And of course, uh, the asymptomatics are the black uh, on the top uh, line there and below are the mild cases, uh, serious cases in blue, and the elbow you can just about see is uh, fatal. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, a bit of tongue in cheek here, Mike, from the science team, but it sort of tells the picture here of has the threat been over exaggerated? And that's really the point, not to take anything away or not being disrespectful to anybody that has lost uh, or, had an, or, or people who have fallen ill because of this. What we're saying is the point is getting so ridiculous, the, the, the analysis and the media reporting right now. And so we are injecting a little bit of light humor in there just to rattle the conversation a little bit and say, how far off are we on this? Uh, absolutely. But if there's one takeaway from this program, Patrick, I think it is that if the government attempts to move towards an immunity passport and they attempt to use uh, uh, antibody tests as a basis for that, there's some pretty big questions to be answered there and uh, that should be raising alarm bells. Uh, I think we'll, we'll leave it at that point. Yeah, I think so. Look, do your own, I know this sounds like a cliche, Mike, yeah, uh, but do your own research yes. because you can't really trust everything that's coming from government. And so if you have to become a quick study, on epidemiology and science, uh, science of epidemics, then there's plenty of good material that's uh, available on, absolutely. on uh, UK Column, 21st Century Wire, The Off Guardian, and a, and a number of great websites and independent media outlets. And also Unheard uh, as well uh, is a YouTube channel that has all these great interviews from all these great ap academics that are not really getting a voice on the BBC or on mainstream platforms. Absolutely. So. Okay, we will leave it there for today. Um, have a great weekend. Thanks for joining us, Patrick. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back at the same time uh, on Monday as usual. Uh, see you then. Bye-bye.